Okay, baby, we're live, but hold your horses. Hang tight just for a second. We got to let it breathe. We got to bring on our great Facebook community. And then we'll fire this bad boy off proper. Welcome in. It is the Huddle Up Podcast presented, as always, by Mile High Huddle and powered by Blue Wire Podcasts. I'm your host, Chad Jensen, with me, my fellow football priest. You know him, you love him. He is the decipherer of anonymous NFL executive missives to journalists across the fruited plain. Zach Kelberman. Zach, your story about, well, I guess I might as well just pull this up, but I think many Broncos fans were chagrined, to say the least, uh, to read this. NFL executive, Broncos, whoop, Broncos viewed as fourth best team in the AFC West. There are a lot of nuggets, Zach, I want to read directly from this, but first things first. What was your reaction as you wrote this thing up to a, an executive, NFL current executive, anonymously kind of panning the Russell Wilson trade and pumping the brakes on anything positive for the Broncos? Well, first I had to ask, who, who was under the byline? Was it Nick Wright? Was it Colin Coward? It sounds like something they would say, fourth best in the division. I mean, are you serious? They're below the Raiders and the Chargers. I understand apprehension and, and trepidation about listing the Broncos over Kansas City, but my God, give them – some of their flowers, they deserve it. And blow for blow here, I kind of take down the anonymous execs, plural, who bagged on the Broncos and bagged down Denver. One, the most ridiculous claim, that's why I didn't bury the lead. They said the Broncos wanted Aaron Rodgers. That's who they wanted, and they pretty much settled for Russell Wilson. Um, that's not true at all. As I outlined in the article, they were all in on Russell Wilson. They never made an offer for Aaron Rodgers. It never seemed plausible he was going to leave Green Bay. It was more of a media and fan creation, and they got their guy all along in Russell Wilson. But if you scroll through the story, it's comments like that. Careful what you wish for, Russell. Who's going to take the top off the coverage in Denver with their long stride speed? This is a quote from an anonymous NFL executive, a nameless guy who can't put – Obviously, his name to his quote. Tim Patrick was a special teams player who made himself into a receiver. Cortland Sutton does run quite the same after his injury, at least from what I saw. Jerry Judy is small bodied. Okay, well, the answer to that question is KJ Hamler, who runs a 427. That's going to be their speed demon. I mean, scroll down even more. We covered this, Chad, in a previous podcast because I wrote another story based around more. Uh, who was the, the Chiefs GM a couple weeks ago? I, I forget already. Uh, I forgot. It. What was his name? The, Who, the Chiefs GM? Yeah. Uh, the Who, old one, Scott Pioli. Scott Pioli. He said the same exact thing, and I kind of wanted to tag along with this story as well, that uh, Russell Wilson needs an elite defense and a running game. Well, he has a running game in Javante Williams, and they have a defense who finished third in scoring and eight in points in, in the yards per game last year. So it's baseless dreck that these anonymous sources are saying, and they don't even have the courage or the cojones, the cashews, to put – their money where their mouth is, in other words. I love taking it down. I love writing these stories, if only to say three words in response. Let them hate. Let me remind everybody. And by the way, we're really excited tonight. We get to sit down and have a chat with one of our great superstar members of the community, Kayaka. We're stoked. We'll get to him in just a couple minutes. He's going he's gonna to drop some knowledge for us. But, you know, when you talk about a quarterback like Russell Wilson that needs a defense, right, needs an elite defense, well, Let's put this in perspective. The Denver Broncos under John Elway didn't win a Super Bowl until they had a defense. Peyton Manning as a Colt, he was he was known as the guy that could just never get over the hump. And even in 2006, when that Colts team finally did get over the hump, got to the Super Bowl and then beat the Bears, that year, guess what? Their defense was horrendous until down the stretch, Bob Sanders returned. That whole thing coalesced and gelled. The Colts don't make it through that playoff gauntlet without a defense playing at an elite level. Fast forward to 2013, you've got the Star Wars numbers out the yin-yang. You've got Peyton Manning throwing down record numbers, but you don't have the defense. You're missing seven-plus starters on defense. You get to the Super Bowl, the Seahawks punch you in the mouth. It's all she wrote. Fast forward two more years, 2015, Peyton Manning starting to really lose his, uh, you know, lose his physical faculties. Thank God, though. You had an elite defense. Broncos go all the way. Peyton Manning wins the Super Bowl. My point here, in both cases, similar to Russell Wilson's Super Bowl victory in, in Super Bowl 48, when Peyton Manning won the Super Bowl as a, as a NFL player, he had the benefit of not only that big football brain, all that quarterback talent, all that skill position talent, but an elite defense. So what he's saying here is like, well, yeah, no duh. 
Tom Brady, if you don't get that defense playing at the level that it did a couple years back when the Bucks won it. So I guess what I'm I'm saying here is this it really is weird that it's an executive stir in the pot. It's a current executive. It'd be one thing, Zach, if it was like a former exec like Pioli, who's now trying to maybe make a name for themselves in media, but these are, as the athletic claims, current NFL execs. It's lazy. It, it, they're lazy takes. No different. Just because they're working in the NFL, supposedly, that's what Sando tells us. It could be some random source. Just because they have employment in the NFL doesn't make them any different than a random scribe who's spouting off nonsense about the Broncos. They don't know what they're talking about because they don't cover them. They don't look at them. They don't delve deep like we do in the local markets. They'll all see. They can say what they want. I mean, I, I understand the need to cover these stories, write these stories, discuss these stories, take down these stories, but they will all see Scott Pioli, these nameless, ballless execs saying these things. They need some manscape, Chad, because they have no nether regions to take care of. They will all see come this fall that the Broncos are different than the Raiders in that division, different than the Chargers in that division, and they will go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Kansas City in that division for AFC West supremacy. It's going to taste so sweet. The crow pies we're going to be baking out of Denver this season will be <laughs> extra sweet. I promise you that. More to get to on that topic, and we're going to grab Kayaka. First, real quick, we're going to tip our cap and say thank you to the Duchess herself, Michaela Parker in the house. We can't wait till we get to hang out with you again, by the way, Michaela. Love you so much. Thank you for everything you. that you do. Very generous. She says, let them hate 2.0. Hello, haters. Keep on hating. We'll have the last laugh. Amen, Zach. But how blessed are we to have such a great community maven amongst us in Michaela the Duchess. Love you. Michaela, we are extremely blessed. Thank you so much. I'm going to be cackling. I'm going to be obnoxious. I have been since the Russell Wilson trade. I will continue to be because I am confident in this year's Broncos outfit. It is different this year, Chad. You know it. I know it. Kayaka knows it. Scott knows it. Everyone knows it about this Denver team. It is different. And I'm going to be pointing the finger and being obnoxious and hold every single person accountable from Nick Wright to nameless NFL execs who won't even put their name on these quotes. They will all see. And I'm going to say, you were wrong. You were wrong. You you were wrong. You were wrong. And I'll tell you one more thing. It's going to feel damn, damn good. Let him choke on that crow. <laughs> All right. The time has come. Without further ado, this isn't technically Kayaka's first appearance on the Huddle Up podcast because at the meet and greet week three last year, he made the trip from paradise out in the placid, beautiful Pacific. I guess it's called the Pacific for a reason. To the Mile High City. We hung out. He and I watched a football game together. Then we afterwards podcasted he was able to make a brief appearance while we were kind of rotating as many of our great um friends that we made there onto the show so we didn't get as much time to sit and talk with him w on camera on mic as long as we would have liked so we're going to rectify that right now with kayaka in the house the living legend himself official this is kayaka official what is good bro thank you so much for spending some time with us tonight and making some time with us how are you bro i'm good gentlemen how are you good to be back Dude, we just really been looking forward to this. Honestly, this is, um, you know, we had so much fun with you last, what was that, end of September, that we've just really been uh, looking forward to this. So first things first, we got a, we got a couple of current event issues that we got to get your take on. We're going to get to it. I just want to put a pin in it for a second because one of the things our listeners love hearing about when there's a superstar segment is how people became fans. Who are their favorite players? Things like that. So we're going to ask you a couple of those things, and then we'll get to the current events. So first things first, I think most everybody knows that you hail from Hawaii. That being the case, we have so many different great members of our community that listen from Hawaii. You're going to have to explain to us why that is, that there's so many great Bronco fans in your neck of the woods. And then also, being that you are separated from the mainland, as it were, how did you, Kayaka, become such a big, dedicated, passionate, knowledgeable Broncos fan? Well. First off, as I uh, mentioned before, in Hawaii, there's a good divide of probably four teams in the NFL that people are fans of. One's the Broncos. People may not believe that, but it's very, very true. Um, the San Francisco 49ers, the <clears throat> Raiders, and then also uh, Seattle Seahawks. Seahawks probably because it's just a West Coast Pacific team. But um, as far as me becoming a Bronco fan, I was, I'd have to say I was born and, and bred to be a Bronco fan. You know, it's one of those things where, you know, you pick up 
your love of cars from your dad. And it's basically the same way, perhaps a little bit more than, you know, just being a, a car guy. This uh, Broncos country stuff, it runs runs pretty deep. Oh, I appreciate you joining us tonight, Kayaka. You know where I'm going with this question. As a Broncos fan, what has been your favorite memory and what has been your least favorite memory? Oh, my favorite memory has got to be Super Bowl 32. We finally got it with John. That's that's definitely number one for me as far as the positive side. Uh, the negative side, I'm going to say when Elway retired, I was one of those those fans who thought if they kept everything together and went one more time, we could have had that three peak. But uh, that's that's probably my sad day number one. That was a sad day, man. I mean, it was <laughs> sixteen years we had him, right, John Elway, and how good it was. There was a couple of years there where there just wasn't the help around him, and they floundered a little bit. But by and large, it was. Very similar to having Peyton. If you if John Elway was healthy and he was mostly healthy, reading his book, reading you know the book that Jason Cole wrote on, on him, you realize that healthy is a relative word because he was quite banged up and injured a lot, but he would play through it. But we knew if we if Elway was there, man, it was a uh, as close as you could get to a guarantee of making the playoffs. So I feel you. That being said, though, you know, as someone who was also baptized in the orange and blue by my father. All right, growing up, talk about born and bred. Shout out Mark Jensen. Um, how did you? But now let me put it this way: If you were to say, "I'm going to create the Kayaka Denver Broncos Mount Rushmore," four pivotal, most pivotal figures in your mind of the Denver Broncos, what would that Mount Rushmore be? Oh, uh, that's gonna that'll be pretty easy to start off with my number one pick, and that would be the aforementioned John Elway. Um, also on there would be Terrell Davis. I'm going champ Bailey and it's, it's a pretty close toss up between Randy Gratishar and Peyton Manning. It's a pretty solid, pretty unique list. I, I would say from how many people we've surveyed about this question, we sure. took a trip down memory lane, Kayaka. I, I'm interested in the present right now. So we have now eight days until the draft. Let's say George Payton is no longer the Broncos GM. The Broncos GM is now Kayaka. Who are you taking at 64? Are you staying at 64? What are you doing? What do you think the Broncos first pick should be uh, next Friday? If I were GM, I would try to package, you know, a couple picks, maybe one this year, two next year, move up a few to try to get back into the first round to get and solidify that right spot, that right side on the offensive line. And I'm taking Trevor Penning. I like it. Absolutely. Cosign. By the way, in case you guys didn't know, the man joining us right now at one point was a very prolific football player himself, prolific running back back in the day. Did yeah. you were telling me some of your war stories? Was it running back or was it cornerback? Running back. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. Yeah. Uh, dude, you uh, you took some bumps and bruises. You amongst – I mean, I, I'm sure there are quite – a, a number of people who listen to our show that played football at some level in high school, but you took it beyond that. Tell everybody how far you got and what happened. If you, I mean, if you want to talk about it. Sure. No problem. So I got offers and essentially took those offers to play at UNC, which is the university of Northern Colorado. Um, in high school, I was running back and tailback, or um, I'm sorry, running back and uh, safety, but solely, at the next level, it was just running back. I was just too too short, I would say, to play safety on defense. Yeah, dude. And uh, had some bad luck with the injury bug, right? Yeah, tore the ACL in the left knee. Um, back then, sorry, I'm aging myself here, but back then. Join the club, <laughs> homie. Yeah. Back then, the, the ACL, the complete tear of the ACL was really, really severe and career threatening mm -hmm. and so when the doctor you know gave me those words those dreaded words that you may not be able to play football ever again that it sat pretty pretty harsh for me so i ended up not even getting my surgery which is crazy two i uh didn't go back to school i stopped i stopped going completely which is 
regretful, you know, definitely regretful now, but, uh, I, I should have stuck with it. I mean, Hey, if we could live our lives based on hindsight, we'd all be Albert Einstein 24 seven. Right. But, uh, very cool. All right, Zach, I know you, you've got a question for him there. Talk to Kayaka. Yeah, I just I have a, a serious question and a non-serious question. Non-serious is Kayaki. We talked about running back. You playing that position? How soon would you take a running back? Please don't say the second or third round in the draft this year. I, I just think it's. What do you think about the running the Broncos running back situation? We all understand. We all recognize they do need to add at least one more player there. But where are you adding that player? And what? Yeah, round? I am not going second round. Not going third round. I'm probably thinking somewhere around five which would be the way I would go I uh, as far as what we have now with Javante Williams and Mike Boone. I'm loving it from the little sample size we had from Mike Boone last year. Yes. I want him to get some more, some more action. You know, it'd be great to have Melvin Gordon back. I'm not sure what's going on there. I know they mentioned the Broncos being, they said that uh, they were in talks with the representatives for Melvin Gordon. Not sure what's going to transpire there, but I'm good with or without him. So I, I and as far as the draft, I'm waiting till round five, round six, and then I'd, I'd probably take one. I needed that one for my ego. The, the serious question, Kayaka, was, um, you know, obviously Russell Wilson is all of our favorite moves. What has been your second favorite move that George Payton's made this offseason? This offseason, I am super, super stoked about K1 Williams. You know, just looking at, but watching some of the games last year, just, you know, watching football, I've mm -hmm. seen two, maybe three uh, games of his. And I liked what I see. He's a ball hawk. He creates turnovers. He gets turnovers. Yeah. And that's something that the Broncos defense has been lacking for quite a while now. Yeah. Despite all the best efforts of Vic Fangio's vaunted defense they just couldn't get after the queue and they couldn't take the ball away to say well and yeah. this last year too i mean they dipped um on third down and i mean that's the that's the death sentence all right one more for you bro and then we'll cut you loose again we're talking with kayaka official in the house tonight um what was your reaction dude when when you know, because it was in successive order. Bronco fans at this point, there was so much rumor, so much conjecture pointing to Aaron Rodgers. I mean, if we wrote one Aaron Rodgers story, Zach, at Mile High Huddle from December to March 14th, we probably wrote, no lie. A thousand. 40 or 50? <laughs> Felt like No a lie. Thousand. Yeah. Okay. So then Bronco fans find out, oh, guess what? Yeah, he's staying in Green Bay. And so there's like this wave of disappointment that kind of flows west across the plains and to the Rockies. And then all of a sudden, just as that wave kind of settles in, boom, news, Broncos acquire Russell Wilson from the Seahawks. What was your gut reaction to hearing that news? Uh, my only reaction was just simple. Wow. And, you know, that saying that is in the best way possible. Getting Russ is honestly – I may be in the minority in this, but I am one of the few that actually preferred him over Aaron Rodgers simply because he's got a lot more time left. You know, I don't want to just rent Aaron Rodgers for, you know, the next two, maybe three years. You know, so with Russell Wilson, he's 33. And with him saying he wants to play another 10, 12 years, which is absolutely crazy, I'll take that. I have a bonus question for you. We have a few more seconds here, Kayaka. I'm going to write a story about this. I tweeted about this. Von Miller, new Buffalo Bill, was asked today if he feels the Bills have a hangover after the playoff loss to Kansas City. This is what Von Miller said, guys. You can uh, see these shots for yourself. We talking about hangover? I've been in Denver. We're talking about six years. Shots fired or no shots fired, Kayaka? Ooh. Maybe be, I'm going to go low key shots fired. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to go low key on that one. Um, yeah, I mean, but he's not lying. He's not, you know, no lies were told. Right. right. It is what it is. It is. It's like, Hey, did you have to mention, did you have to point out that it was me that farted in that meeting? I mean, everybody knew, but did you have to say it? You know what I'm saying? Hey, Kayaka in the house guys, follow him on Twitter. Let me tell you something. He is a great Twitter follow it's at kayaka official how do you spell the name for those of you listening only k-e-a-k-a -A. 
official. Simple as that. Connect with him on Twitter. We're connected with him. We love him. Kayaka, dude, always a pleasure to talk Broncos, to talk ball with you. Thanks for making time for us, and we will be talking and I'm sure seeing you in the not-too-distant future, bro. My guys, once again, I appreciate you guys. Broncos country, I love you, and aloha. All right, there he goes, Kayaka. Follow him on Twitter. He's a legend. I probably didn't do that right, but appreciate you, Kayaka. He is so fun to hang out with too, man. Like just very chill. And, very cool uh, guy. Very cool, very knowledgeable, uh, very passionate, as you can tell, about his uh, Denver Broncos. And um, we could we could have probably spent more time on there, but he's got a life to lead, you know, We're visiting family right now. So making time for us, we really appreciate that. Got yes, some Kayaka. glowing reviews. If he was Rowan on Yelp, he'd be a five-star, man. I mean, we got Greg Smith coming in here. Podcast Yelp. Michaela, we got Dylan Von Arks, the moderator. Always a pleasure. It really is. Every time I listen to you, Kayaka, I get to interact with you. It's always a pleasure. We appreciate you. You are a valued, valued member, and you know that. Heck yeah, brother. Lawrence, what's up, fellas? Throwing down some stars. Appreciate that, Lawrence. On the topic of stars, by the way, as you guys can probably see here on the ticker on the video screen, we're trying to reach 250,000 stars on Facebook in the month of April. When we do, we're going to raffle off a Broncos jersey of the winner's choosing. Only people in the running, as you know, are those who contribute to the goal. Problem is we're at 26% complete, and we're well past the the halfway mark in uh, the month of April. So I still have very little doubt, Zach, that we will eventually hit the goal in the month of April. It might be another 11th hour push, you know, in the clutch, uh, come from behind, two-minute drill type situation. But just letting everybody know um, where we're at. Joshua, thank you, big dog. Really, really appreciate you. And Patrick in the house, what's going on, bro? Um, people been patient while we, we've been talking early on and then chit-chatting with Kayaka. This is interesting real quick. I hate to cut you off, Chad, yeah. but Mount Rushmore of MHH listeners, we never really pondered that. I think we're going to have to put something that, like that together. That is, I mean, I've, how do you even do that, though? How do you have just four? I'm not well, going to pare that list down. In, in Mile High, the good news is there's a lot of mountains. So our Mount Rushmore... Could be a manifold mountain replete with many visages. A mountain up range. In the granite. Yes. Yes. But yeah, uh, as we are going to roll out our uh, YouTube membership offering here in the near future, we're going to have some cool stuff like that where Mount Rushmore, Super Chat, Superstars and Supporters and whatnot will be listed on Mastheads. It's going to be really cool. We've been putting the uh, wood on that fire for a few months now, and we're about ready to roll it out. But guys, because I know you want to, you need to know this too. Super chat contest for the month of April, top five finishers, cumulatively speaking, in the month of April, those five names go in a hat. One gets drawn out, Broncos jersey of the winner's choosing. DWI guys currently in the lead, followed by the Duchess right there at number two. D-Dub, another great Hawaiian member of our community at three. Pobby at four. Tom at four. Five and ain't nothing but a G thing. Uh, Nash the fifth, Sam Bam, the queen, Daniel, just a few of the names you can see here. Cottonmouth, Oi Boy, Corey H, the Bugmeister, etc., etc. We love you guys. There's your update on where the super chat, uh, superstar rankings stand. And uh, with that, Zach, let's get to some questions. Let's get to some content. Um, Marcus Lewis Hanna across the pond. What's up, bro? Thank you. He says, Hey guys, wow, these NFL execs do talk some bull. Anyway, guys, love and respect from UK to you and all Bronco fans. Come on, Russell and Broncos. Ram the hate down those haters' throats. MHH forever. Go Broncos. Ride, baby. I love it. Zach, let me, I, I think it was at the end of your piece. Um, yeah. So here is another executive anonymously telling Sando of the Athletic quote. This is something we've been saying, right? Remember that energy, that but why did Peyton Manning suddenly transplanted in the Mile High City? Why? How was he able to, already on a Hall of Fame resume, just what he did in Indianapolis alone, Hall of Fame, then four years in Denver, he's able to somehow microwave a level of production heretofore unprecedented. How did that happen? This quote, I think, is a, is a, a clue. And this is what another exec told Sandal. Quote, it feels like people are underselling Wilson a little bit based off some of the injuries and how it has gone between him and Seattle management over the last couple of years. Fresh start. There is going to be a bump there in terms of what he brings to the table and what he has from a play standpoint. I think it is going to be really good for him. Zach, close quote. 
You mean to tell me it's going to be a bump up from Teddy Bridgewater and Drew Locke and Case Keenum and Paxton Lynch and Joe Flacco and Trevor Simeon? I can go on and on and on. Yeah, that's it's obvious. And it's pretty telling that among three or four surveyors uh, in this poll, only one answered that Russell Wilson is going to bring a positive experience to the Broncos. They didn't go all negative with it. So that's where the Broncos stand as of now in the 10,000 foot view of those inside and outside the NFL, those who root for the game, those who cover the game, those who get paid to be a part of the game. The Broncos are still that basement dwelling team in the AFC West. They're even down below LA and Vegas. That will all change this fall, but it cannot change until this fall. That's what me and Chad are saying all along here. They have to prove it on the field. They start going 1-0 and then 2-0 and then 3-0 and then 4-0 and then maybe 5-1, and but you see where I'm going with this. They're going to string off wins. They're going to be relevant, and then these nameless execs won't be nameless any longer. They'll be willing to put their name on these quotes. You know why? Because the quotes will be positive. They'll all, it'll come around. By the way, Phil, yes, Kayaka. He says, great to hear him tell it like it is. Amen, dude. And real quick, Zach, before I forget, Mike Reno, great member of our community. He's a monthly paying supporter of MHH on Facebook. He sent me a question. I promised him we would answer his question tonight live on the show. He said, do you think the Broncos can uh, or will trade up based on draft position to land our right tackle that we have needed for years zach your answer for the great mike reno i don't know about trading up man that's if you didn't pull off the blockbuster trade i'd say maybe but the way george payton is talking about the way that a lot of nfl people are talking the strength of this draft is in the middle rounds luckily for the broncos second third fourth fifth maybe even the undrafted ranks so i don't know about moving up especially because they have no capital next year either they have what four picks for 2023 they don't even have future capital to use I think he's going to stay put. He's going to stay true to his board, George Payton. He might move up like one spot and use an extra seventh round pick or something, but I don't see him making any big time moves for any certain player. He's going to let the board fall to him, as probably he should. It was a very interesting read. Hopefully, you guys, uh, this published a couple hours back. I'm sure a lot of you have already read it, but under the Finding Broncos series. Zach, Eric Trickle is publishing a, a series of articles um, where he's going to talk about five plausible targets for the Broncos at each of their top, was it 100 or top 120 picks? Either way, the first one debuted today. So it's five plausible targets for Denver at number 64 in the draft. And I just want to run through a couple of these names for you. First off, he lists the Tulsa offensive lineman. He can play tackle. He can play interior. That's why he's an intriguing option. Tyler Smith. Now you can read through some of Eric's, um, you know, reports on this. He also links to the official scouting report he put out for Smith. But a couple thing here, a couple things, courtesy of the Pro Football Focus metrics. Uh, Smith only allowed 18 total pressures with two sacks in college. Very interesting. Total of 24 career penalties though, with 16 just this past season. Very high, highly graded both as a run blocker, especially, and then as a pass blocker. So there's one also highly mocked to Denver, and so this makes sense. Also, top 30 visit, Abraham Lucas from Washington State, offensive tackle. Uh, again, go read what Eric has to say, but a couple of key stats from PFF. Allowed 49 total pressures and four sacks in college. Uh, only 11 penalties called on him, Zach, in college. Very high pass blocking grade, solid run blocking grade. So he's kind of the inverted Tyler Smith. Uh, then Josh Pascal, Edge, Kentucky. Really cool case of a guy who had to step away from football to beat the living snot out of cancer. Then he came back, kicked some butt. Uh, another option for Denver at 64. Key stats here, courtesy of PFF. Picked up 68 total pressures over the last two years. Um, let's see, 92, or pardon me, 90.2 run defense grade, Zach. Uh, and then an 81.2 pass rush grade. And for those of you who might not fully understand PFF grading, those are both very high marks, all right, for what it's worth. All right, two more. The center, Cameron Jurgens. Cam Jurgens is mainly what you'll hear. Uh, from Nebraska, interesting option. If the Broncos truly are, as there is a rumor out there, maybe looking to upgrade the center position. Um, only allowed one sack and 34 total pressures in college, so that's interesting about him. And then the last one, Nick Bonito, the edge rusher from Oklahoma. Again, go give it a read here, but the notable metrics uh, created a total of 122 quarterback pressures in four years, 101 of which were the last two seasons. All right, And then look, 
his pass rush grade PFF 92.6, which is just phenomenal. And then a better, like slightly above average, more than solid run defense grade. So for what it's worth, guys, there's some options, but Zach getting back to what Mike said, you know, the offensive tackle, I don't think you need to trade up to do it. There's a good chance a guy like Lucas or a guy like Smith will be there at 64. I mean, I appreciate Trickle not including a running back or a tight end on that list. He kept it really realistic, at least in my view, an edge and right tackle. It seems to me if if we were to follow the trends from this offseason, the Broncos picked up nothing but linemen who had better run blocking marks than pass blocking marks. So maybe Tyler Smith is that guy. Or they could reserve that for someone like Abraham Lucas, who's better in pass pro. That's the player that I would target because you have to keep Russell Wilson upright. You have enough good road grading run blockers, you need a couple standout pass protectors. And I think Abe Lucas uh, uh, can fit that bill as well. But if they want to go defense, the biggest need on defense is edge. So I, Benito there would be fine in my book. It's awesome. As we grab this super sticker from the great Mike Ronquillo in Tucson, I also just happened to pass by a comment from Robert Smith on Facebook, also from Tucson. So we got Tucson representing hard tonight on uh, Facebook and YouTube. Michael, love you, bro. Thank you for that super sticker. You know it. GLP, baby. Keeping it alive, Zach. Let them hate. Love it, Gary. Thank you, buddy. Appreciate all that you do for us and all the other podcasts, too. You the man. Let's ride and let them hate. Uh, so we're sitting here at 31 minutes. We're doing pretty good time-wise. So let me pull up a couple other uh, topics here I wanted to get your take on, Zach. Um, you know, we just went through what Trickle talked about as five plausible targets. Well, Daniel Jeremiah and Bucky Brooks, two former NFL scouts and front office guys who now find themselves in NFL media. They're the co-hosts of the Move the Sticks podcast. I'll just kind of read the headline here. We can get into some of the nitty gritty if you want, but they're taking a look at the Broncos roster and they're saying, Zach, Broncos need to go secondary at pick 64. Now we can get into some of the rationale here. Nick did a good job of uh, transcribing a couple of their comments on the podcast, but what are your thoughts on going with a, a corner or going with a safety slash DB there? I mean, I, I view those positions almost like tight end where you, you could take someone, but you have more pressing needs elsewhere. So you have two starting caliber cornerbacks already in Ronald Darby and obviously Patrick Sertan. You have a young guy who you're high on in Michael Ocean Media, too, for that matter, with the same Bassey. But who do you have at right tackle? And I will keep saying this until next week. I mean, who really is there right now? Billy Turner, Tom Compton, Calvin Anderson, all guys on one-year deals. There's nothing for the short term and nothing for the long term. So I recognize the need to take a cornerback to add to that cabinet. I understand the need to take a safety and add to that cabinet, but you open the right tackle cabinet and dust comes out. Mm -hmm. So I would add to that cabinet first if you want to boil it down to simple metrics. Well said. Here's the rationale, though, real quick, just for the sake of conversation. I mean, that's why we're here. Jeremiah says, all right, the Broncos pick 64. You lose a tight end in Noah Fan, but you have Albert Okawebunam. Uh, they're not in dire straits by any stretch. Uh, it's a pretty good roster overall. You could look at the secondary as maybe an area they could address. He kind of floats that. And then Brooks goes, I think they have to address this secondary. As talented as this defense is, we know uh, that they have to continue to upgrade and find a way to keep it down. When you look at all the QB play in this division, they just have to figure it out. So, yeah, I think they have to continue to add pieces to the secondary, which I don't disagree with as a, as a macro meta principle, Zach. But then Jeremiah says, yeah, and I look, and I think the secondary is where they go in Great round analysis. two. Thanks, Daniel. 64. To me, I'm questioning how much do they really look at the roster? Now, look, Nick does a good job of kind of laying out in the article. It's very much worth a read, guys. Make sure you check it out. Um, that secondary is kind of more of a low-key need than fans might realize because once you get past the starters, it gets a little, you know, uh, the, the drop-off's precipitous because behind uh, Patrick Sertan, Kwan Williams, and Ronald Darby, you have Isang Bassi, you have Michael O.J. Mudia. That's it at corner. So I get it. You do need to address secondary. At safety, when you get past uh, Justin Simmons and Kareem Jackson, as far as proven talent goes, there's Caden Stearns, who flashed last year, very intriguing, but by way of like proven, you can hang your hat on it. He's not quite there yet. Uh, Jamar Johnson, and then, you know, perennial practice squad clinger, PJ Locke. So it is, you know, hey, if if the secondary Zach avoids the ravages of the, of the injury bug in 2022, it's a non-issue. But 
it's football. So of course they're not going to be able to completely avoid the ravages of the injury bug. Especially since Laura Landau, I think, is still employed by the Broncos. I mean, you, I forgot even to mention K1 Williams and my little rant about cornerbacks. So you have five right now who are locked into Ross. How many more do you need? I understand the need for injuries and to keep up in the division, this and that, but you're, you have five players there. You only have maybe one. Uh, veteran capable right tackle on the roster and Billy Turner right now. I'm not trusting Tom Compton nor Calvin Anderson in that spot. I don't know how you look at this roster and you bring in an investment like Russell Wilson and the offense and the coaching staff who's geared toward the offense with Nathaniel Hackett. How do you look at their needs and say, oh, they should go safety or cornerback over right tackle? I, I disagree. Yep. Not at, not at pick 64. You know, I really do get what they're trying to say as far as you know, you got to keep loading up at the, on the secondary because of what you're facing in the division. It's similar to me, as you've said, Zach, to the question of tight end and the question of even off-ball linebacker. Uh, want, low-key need, yes. Is it like a, a pressing immediate thing? Not so much in the sense of where's your edge depth, where's your tackle, right tackle depth. I mean, there are three players – you know, three guys that are going to factor into that right tackle this year, but including Billy Turner here. Look, I know he's back, so you get the novelty component, the recency bias. You're like, oh, it's a signing and Billy Turner. But guys, I mean, he wasn't that great when he was here. Now, granted, when he was here before, they played him inside. They played him as a guard. He was solid as a as a tackle, protect, helping to protect Aaron Rodgers. But Tom Compton, lunch pail, kind of jack of all, master of none. And then Calvin Anderson. He's just that guy that you have on payroll and you hope and pray to God you don't have to use him. So no, none of those three names really inspire much. And then you've got this massive investment in Russell Wilson. I'd be stunned, to be frank with you, Zach, if it's not a tackle in round two. Best available tackle, boom, or slash edge rusher. Because the same thing I just said, you can basically repeat when you get beyond Randy Gregory and Bradley Chubb. With the exception of those are too much more accomplished better names to have atop the depth chart than what you got a right tackle right now. Yeah, Compton's a guy who also played guard before converting the tackle. So, I mean, who do you really have there who's a true tackle? Calvin? Is that the guy you want guarding Russell Wilson's edge on the right side? Not me. Thank God Garrett Bowles is some sort of Iron Man in the NFL. They don't have to worry about left tackle depth, but that's a DEFCON 1 kind of need, a right tackle for me. Cornerback is like DEFCON 3. They can wait on that a little longer, like running back, like tight end. This was kind of fun. So Tuesday, Broncos are back in the building, right? We get a little media availability from Draymond Jones and uh, Patrick Sertan. Draymond, you know, he actually said something that was newsworthy. This is newsworthy too, but I mean like information we didn't have before when he said that the new incoming scheme from Ajiro Evero, the new defensive coordinator, schematically, it's the same as Vic Fangio. So they're not changing up the scheme. He'll put his own little spin on things, to quote Draymond. The verbiage is different slightly in certain places, but Evero's doing the best he can to minimize that, any changes to verbiage, uh, to keep it simple for the for the defensive players. But the funnest thing that came out of his media availability was when he was asked about the loss of uh, Shelby Harris, his close buddy, to, in the Seattle trade. Uh, and it was funny. I'll, I'll quote this here. Zach, you had the article, but let me just quote it so people know what we're talking about. Uh, his reaction to the cataclysmic waves sent through Dove Valley when the Russ trade happened. Quote, to be honest, I was like, oh, we got Russell. Then they said they traded for us and some players. So everyone was like, oh, who are the players? But it was cool realizing I'm still here and Russ being here too. I can tell the energy has been totally different in the building from him and Coach Hackett. But then, of course, it comes up Shelby. What about Shelby being part of that package? He said, quote, yeah, that was tough. That's my genuine friend, but it is what it is. It's part of the gig. I can't wait to play Shelby this year in Seattle and whoop his tail too. Close quote. Love it. I, I just love the, the the tone that's being set in the Broncos locker room. They're, I think, overall happier. I, I was just thinking in my mind, Chad, every single time we've read a quote from a player in these press availabilities, the one constant is, Different culture, different feeling, different vibe, different energy. I just love what Nathaniel Hackett has uh, instilled already in the Broncos locker room. And to a lesser extent, is Giro Evero. It feels different, man. And that Seattle-Denver game is going to be must-see TV. It should be prime time for that matter. And I can't wait to see the Broncos come out on top. 
I mean, we just so relish and look forward to the football season finally rolling around. I mean, that goes without saying every year. But kind of like what Vaughn said about, you know, hey, I've, what do you mean? I've been in Denver, dude. I know what it's like. Um, even when it was bad, we look forward to it. But this time, man, it's different because we got Russ. We're going to be a force. The Broncos are going to be a force to be reckoned with. At what level, at what magnitude does the Russell Meteor impact the NFL world? I think it's going to be tectonic. I think it's going to be, uh, you know, category five type thing. But not everyone believes it, as uh, we learned at the top of the show from these anonymous NFL execs. I find it interesting that Vaughn would even say that. Like a couple months after winning another title, he's talking about a six year hangover in Denver. There might be more hurt feelings behind that trade than uh, we all thought. And it seemed like, remember when he was leaving the Broncos facility in that in that SUV and he held that impromptu media session? He looked yep. devastated. And I wouldn't yep. be surprised if he's still kind of uh, not over that yet. I mean, it's the same principle, man, as, you know, you got a girlfriend and you know it ain't right. She knows it ain't right, but maybe she's the one that first kind of moves to break it off. Even though you were probably thinking the same thing, and even on a rational level, you're going, this is the, for the best. It still hurts. It still hurts because you got rejected. She beat you to the punch. It's like the movie uh, The Rocker. Have you ever seen that with uh, Dwight, Dwight Schrute from The Office yeah. plays the lead role of this dude that was in a like a butt rock 80s Bon Jovi type band? And right when they're about to make it big, the record label comes in. And they say, hey, look, we want to sign your band, but you got to get rid of your drummer because the record level, uh, record, uh, the label's president's nephew want, is a drummer and he wants to put his nephew in the band. And they sell him out and they say, okay. And so they 86 him. And then he goes through his whole life as a young adult into his early 40s, watching his band become like the next, you know, ACDC. They're this huge thing and it's eating his heart out. But anyway, he gets fired from his job. This is like within the first 10 minutes of the movie. He gets home and he's just one of these can't catch a break guys. And he gets back to his girlfriend and, and she, she's like, what are you doing home? And he's like, well, you know, they fired me. And so she says, basically, this is the time. And she's about to break it off. And he can tell the way she's winding down her conversation. She's about to say, we're going to, I think I'm going to break up with you. And he goes, I break up with you first. She's like, what? So no, I break up with you first. He got it in first. So he got to have the pride. So maybe he didn't have those same feelings, Zach, that, that Von Miller did of, you know, the unrequited uh, love, as it were. Yeah, it's like, you can't fire me, I quit. Yeah, Vaughn yeah. didn't quit. He actually kind of got fired, but it, it worked out for the best for Vaughn and just uh, sucks he's bringing up Denver in a negative light. Kayaka, this is uh, another another yarn to spin in the legend of Kayaka. Bro, thank you so thank much. You. You contribute to the content, then you come back in. You throw down a super chat, helping us keep the lights on, baby. Love you, bro. He says, Chad, Zach, and Scott, love you guys. We genuinely love you, too. You know this. Uh, Mahalo Nui for the guest spot tonight. Absolute pleasure. Broncos country and MHH Ohana, I appreciate you and all your aloha, love, the best community in all of sports. That's genuine, dude. That's a genuine article right there, Kayaka. That's that's why he's on the Mount Rushmore of MHH for that very reason. Thank you, Kayaka. Moss Def, dude. Seriously. Thanks, buddy. Really do appreciate that. All right. We're at uh, 44 minutes. So let me just take a quick peek in the chat for a second and see what people are saying. Um, all right. Here's an option from Josh Alstrom. Appreciate you being with us, Josh. And this is actually one of the names, if I'm not mistaken, let me pull it up here. I'm pretty sure Nick references this name in the article but uh, josh says one secondary guy we must take if he's there at 64 even though he's secondary jalen peter is that how you say his name scott is it peter petrie petrie thank you uh i think nfl will undervalue him and yes indeed as i scroll down here to the very end nick throws out some options like hey well if the broncos you know if jeremiah and brooks are right and the broncos end up going that direction yep baylor's jalen Petrie, Penn State's Jaquan Brisker, uh, as far as corners, including uh, Georgia's Lewis, is it Sign or Kynes? Kynes? Sign? Uh, and then as far as possible safety options, um, pardon me, those are safeties. And then corner options, Washington's Kyler Gordon, Nebraska's Cam Taylor Britt, or as we've talked about on this podcast before, UTSA's Tariq Woolen. So, you know, I don't know. I just don't think, it depends on who else would be on the board there, my friend, Josh, to be honest with you. Like, 
if all the best tackles that you have graded round one, round two are off the board, all the edges that you have graded round one, round two are off the board. Still, it, to me, it would be like, well, who else was there? I don't want a repeat of 2020 where it's KJ Hamler who, on, you know, on his own merit, good player. And I think that those chickens are finally going to come home to roost. The Broncos are finally going to get a little return on that. But you could have gone a different direction there. And over the last two years, especially because of the injury bug, but maybe even if the injury bug hadn't taken such a big bite out of KJ Hamler, gotten a bigger return on investment just because he was buried on a pretty stacked wide receiver depth chart without prolific quarterback talent. How much were you ever really able to utilize KJ Hamler? Even if you had, you know, the best version of Drew Locke 2019 the whole time, how much were you really going to be getting out of KJ Hamler when you could have gotten, we've gone through some of the names that were there, especially tackles. Um, Kayaka says Martin Emerson should be there at 64. He's a stud corner. Okay. We'll keep an eye on him, bro. That is a perfect analogy, Chad. I can't even try to top that, and I won't try to top that. I agree with that wholeheartedly. I can talk myself into a cornerback in 64. I, I can't do that about a safety. There is no need to take a safety there. When you have a stud in Justin Simmons, you brought back Kareem Jackson as the veteran guy, and you have two young guys you're high on, three if you want to count P.J. Locke, and one of them you're really high on in Caden Stearns, who can be a future starter, who in my mind is the starter uh, regardless of Kareem Jackson. I, I don't know that I would go there. I don't know that I would touch the secondary, despite what anyone else is saying. You mentioned that if the tackles were gone and the edges are gone, what are the odds that happens, though? That every high, highly rated tackle, highly rated edge guy is off the board by the time the Broncos go on the clock at 64 and they have to settle for a cornerback or settle for a safety? I don't know. Yeah. I can't get around to that. We're going to grab two um, messages here from two different Jameses on – YouTube. First, James Hyatt says, Elway and Manning, with them, you always felt we had a chance. Russ brings that as well. What a year this could be. Yeah, what a year, what an era this could be. That's how I'd be looking at this because Russ ain't going to be hanging it up, Zach, anytime in the near future. So I think that's why you're going to really see George Payton go all in, dude, on building the nest. What's the best thing to compliment Russell Wilson? Now, it really comes down to a philosophical perspective because you know go back to one of those doubter executives all right if you are george payton and you think well to really make sure we put russ in the best position possible to succeed we feel like he's got the horses on offense like to get by not only get by especially offensive line get by but like you know you've got some good skill position options there so maybe the best thing to build the nest around russ would stock up on defense and take an edge in round two and take some corners and some linebackers whatever or maybe it is the perspective of we need to get him a tackle. We need to keep, you know, we want to talk about building the nest. Let's keep Russ comfy in that nest, get a tackle. But either way, it's about building around Russ because you now have a genuine window. I got to remind everybody, including those anonymous NFL executives, Russell Wilson, 10 years as a pro, eight of them, he led his team to the playoffs. Two of them, he led his team to the Super Bowl. One of them, he won the Super Bowl. Plus, in those 10 years, nine-time Pro Bowler. Still hasn't received one MVP vote. Questionable. I'm glad you brought up the W word, which is window. Because as, as great as the Broncos roster is right now and as high as the prospects are, they do have a window they have to try to squeeze through in the next, I would say, two, three years max. You talk about the core on offense, well, when you have a receiving core like the Broncos do, it's hard to keep that together. Just ask the Cowboys and Amari Cooper flipping him for what a third round pick or whatever it was, mid round pick. They have a finite window to jump through with players on below market contracts like Corlin and Tim Patrick. You're going to have to maybe pay some of these guys down the road, Jerry, Judy, maybe Albert O. They have two years and probably two more years of true Russell Wilson prime to win a title. But in those two years, I think they will either do that, Chad, or come very close to doing that. If you look up and down this roster, you look up and down this coaching staff, and in today's NFL, with hot shots like McVay achieving instant success, there is no reason why Nathaniel Hackett, Russell Wilson, can't do the same for Denver. I expect that. Oh, James wants to know, where is the MHH festivities in Vegas? So Zach and I are going to be in Vegas next week for the draft. We still have the intention of hosting um, a modest meet and greet. Problem is uh, everyone in media from across the fruited plain 
is descending on Las Vegas. So as we have tried to, we had to kind of wait until we got our credential cleared. Once our credential cleared, then we're like, all right, let's get everything booked because you don't want to spend a bunch of money booking and then find out you don't get the credential, right? So we had to wait. And the NFL is legendary amongst media in waiting till the 11th hour to hand, send out its credential approvals. So once we got word, we started booking all the things we needed to book. The last thing that has been the hardest thing to nail down is we want to have a like a meeting, small meeting slash conference room in one of the casinos, even if it's not the hotel we're going to be staying in um, one right there on that, the four corners there. And so far it's been very difficult. Three of the places don't have anything to offer right now. Everything's either booked out or they're not taking any new um, reservations. There's one still in the hopper right there that I'm hoping to hear back on tomorrow. So we were hoping to be able to tell you guys tonight, it's going to be tomorrow. We'll have an answer for you on that tomorrow, James. But even if we don't get the room, We'll do something fun. We'll say, hey, here's where we're going to be to, you know, cozy up at the bar, grab a table somewhere at a place, and uh, here's where we'll be. So we'll we'll make sure it happens. Just don't quite yet have the specifics to give you, so I don't want to steer you wrong, but it's coming. Trust. And if uh, anyone plans to come out next Thursday, Friday, Saturday, can't wait to meet each and every one of you. We will make sure to do something, and we'll have more info on that in the next 24 hours, more than likely. Michael throwing down a huge Thank super you, chat, bro. Thank you so Thank much, you. my friend. This is a great show tonight, Chad and Zach, on the Mile High Huddle. Let's ride and go Broncos. I always thought it was so funny, dude, when um, you know, when I first started Mile High Huddle back in 2014, one of the founding members of the staff then was Brandon Perna on Mile High Huddle. And when he would do his little intro to the videos, his thing is videos. Everyone knows this about Brandon, one of the most talented video guys of all time, to be frank. But he would always say, the Mile High Huddle. And I would... I would get a kick out of it. The mile high huddle, the highest of the huddles or something like that. It was always funny. Uh, so when I see that, I, I rem reminded of that, Michael, but dude, thank you so much, bro. You're a legend. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Phil jumping in. And by the way, we're at 53 minutes. So any burning questions, topics, get them in. We're about out of here for tonight. Phil, uh, good Lord. In my opinion, we have one of the top five or 10 cues in the NFL. So I would spend all my picks on offense, unless we can grab, a top edge. Got to assume injury will happen. You know, I hate to be the negative guy, but, you know, take like a Nick Kendall pragmatic approach. What are the odds? If the best predictor, Zach, of future behavior or future production is the past, then you have to assume, you just have to plan on one of, if not both, Bradley Chubb and Randy Gregory going to miss some time this year. So who do you got behind him? Fair point, Phil. Also, maybe Ronald Darby in the secondary. He's been injury prone in his career. He might miss some time. Yeah, I mean, I agree. The Broncos have to utilize a high round draft pick on right tackle. You can add a running back, add a tight end, maybe, maybe add like a speed demon receiver. You don't have to add. I, you can't use all of your picks on that side of the ball. They do have depth concerns at edge, inside linebacker for sure. Uh, defensive end replacing Shelby Harris, something they really didn't do even with uh, the DJ, DJ Jones acquisition. Cornerback help, safety help later in the rounds. Peyton, I wouldn't be surprised. He has nine draft picks if he uses five and four right down the middle on both sides of the ball. And by the way, Albert says he can't make it to the Vegas uh, thing, but he'll make the next one in Denver. It's all good, bro. We'll, uh, get, we're going to have a couple opportunities that we'll host at home um, when the football season rolls around. So we'll look forward to seeing you then, bro. Todd Ostendorf on uh, YouTube wants to know, um, what position group, Zach, would you like to see? And by the way, bon, uh, Ben, let's ride indeed, big dog. Thank you, buddy. What position group would you like to see the Broncos hit early in the draft and then maybe even double dip? You know, they, uh, they've done that. They did it last year at safety, right? In the same round. Offensive line. And right tackle is not the only need. You need a center. Uh, you need a guard. You can use probably two tackles if we're being honest. So, yeah, I'm not just double dipping. I'm triple dipping. I'm putting all my saliva into that chip bowl, Chad, because <laughs> they need it. They really need the help. You're like, this chip bowl belongs to me now. <laughs> Mine now. I'm the captain now. Uh, that's right. Listen to me. Look at me. Look at me. I am the captain now. Shout out, Captain Phillips. What a hero. Um, Todd, appreciate you, big dog. Um, okay, let me see if there's any last burning topics that I see in here. Shout out to Big E Bronco. Good to see you, bro. Um, silent one also. 
Yeah, let's see. Let's debate this real quick. Silent one says, when it's all said and done, the 97 through 98 Broncos should have seven Hall of Famers. So let's count what they have now. John Elway, Gary Zimmerman, Terrell Davis, Shannon Sharp. I'm missing anybody? Oh, Atwater. Hello. Five. So two more. If you if I were to say of that group, who is deserving? And I'm just going to keep it on the player side because obviously Mike Shanahan should be needs in. to be in the hall. Yeah. It is egregious. But in the Hall of Fame's defense, remember when we had Jason Cole, who's a Hall of Fame voter, on the show last uh, last summer to promote his uh, Elway book? He said one of the markers that the voters look for is they're not going to induct someone into the Hall whose team hasn't put them in the ring. And the Broncos didn't put Mike in the ring till last year. So I think you're going to start seeing some momentum for Mike in the Hall for what it's worth. But five guys already in the Hall. He's saying seven. If I had to throw one in off the off – the, top of my head immediately without even having to think about it rod smith deserves to be in the hall of fame if rod smith was a first round pick like michael irvin was he would already be in the hall of fame the only reason rod smith is not zach in the hall of fame is because he didn't hear his name called on draft day and that is an egregious miscarriage of justice that frankly flies in the face of what the nfl is supposed to be about yeah, it's a travesty. Same with Mike Shanahan. I mean, those are two Broncos that deserve to be inducted into Canton. You took it right out of my uh, my mouth, Chad. I'm, I would add in there maybe Ed McCaffrey, but he's maybe more of the Hall of Very, Very, Very Good yep. than the Hall of Fame. But you definitely have a case for two. So there's seven. We'll just count Mike and uh, agree with you, Silo, and because I don't think Alfred Williams was quite prolific enough to, to honestly earn Hall of Fame consideration. Not, uh, Neil Smith, mm, very Hall of Very Good. John Mobley, Hall of Very Good. Um, Bill Romanowski, Hall of Very Good. Hall of Crazy. Crazy. Oh, show. Sheldon, thanks for that super chat, big dog. You the man. I'm going through that defense real quick. Tyrone Braxton, Hall of the Solid. Uh, Darian Gordon, Hall of the Solid. Uh, Ray Crockett, Hall of the Solid. You get back on offense outside of Zimmerman. Tommy Nalen. Tommy Nalen. Boom. Tommy Nalen should be in the DACM Hall of Fame. Shout out to Thomas Hall, who has been a great champion of Tom Nalen getting in the Hall of Fame. Tom's got a new podcast that's going to be coming out very, very soon on MHH, guys. Look forward to it called Legends a Mile High. Um, but yeah, Zach, so I'll say eight when you count Mike, Tommy Nalen, Rod Smith. If you look at it brick for brick and you compare Tom Nalen's resume to the centers that are currently in the Hall of Fame, he actually puts most of them to shame. So, for what it's worth. Now I'm just doing in my head, I'm comparing him to the Rams. How many future Hall of Famers do the Rams have? I mean, you can include Stafford. I know you're a Stafford guy, but Aaron Donald, maybe Jalen Ramsey, if you want to count Vaughn as being a part of that team. It's just crazy when you stack up what the Broncos did in those years versus what teams are doing now, how chock full of talent those rosters were. I mean, when you're talking about six legitimate Hall of Famers, I mean, at least five. It's it's wild. And yeah, how could I forget, Kayaka? You also got to throw in Mr. B. So you got six from that era in the Hall. So it took a while, but the Hall of Fame has eventually looked back on that era of Broncos and has recognized uh, them. And, yes, of course, Todd, how could I forget the Broncos? I mean, long live Courtney Brown, right? Long live Ebenezer Ekubon. Long live Gerard Warren, who ended Drew Brees' career in San Diego, for what it's worth. But, guys, that's got to do it. Zach. Let's bounce. Yes, sir. Thank you to Kayaka for coming on tonight. Thank you to Michaela and all our Super Chat superstars for chipping in as they always do. That was the Huddle Up Podcast. We are off until tomorrow night, same time, same place, 6 o'clock Mountain, 8 o'clock Eastern. Until that time, follow us on Twitter at Huddle Up Pod. You can follow the main account on Twitter at Mile I Huddle. You can follow Chad on Twitter at Chad and Jensen. You can follow myself at Kelberman NFL. Follow Scott on Twitter at Scout Kennedy. If you guys want our merch, you guys know where to go, but I'm going to say it one more time. I'll say it every night. HuddleUpPod.com. Get your merch right there. And Facebook.com slash MyLaHuddlePod. Like that page. Follow that page. Guys, if you haven't, go to Apple Podcast and leave your football priest a five-star review for a chance to win some merch each and every month. But if you can't do those things, please do three things we ask so kindly of you. Subscribe, like, and share this video and every video you see on the MHH channel. It really helps us grow and reach more Broncos fans just like you. Amen. And again, shout out to Kayaka. Big props, my brother. Aloha. Mahalo. You know how it is. Great Super Chat superstar as well. The Duchess. 
Love Michaela Parker. Thank you, Sheldon. Uh, Michael Ronquillo, Sheldon, yes. Um, and then our great supporters on Facebook tonight, Phil McLaughlin throwing down, The Aviator, Shane Daniels, Joshua Mize, Gary Leeds Palmer, Marcus Lewis Henna, C. Patrick Havener, Ben Wallman, Lawrence Rivera. Much love and respect. We'll be back tomorrow night, as Zach mentioned. Don't forget, in the morning, Broncos for breakfast on the bright. Take care, and as always, guys, go Broncos.